and welcome to Answer Me 10, the podcast, with me, Barbara Dixon. Having been interviewed many times over the years, I'm always conscious of the generic nature of interviewing. And in my case, it usually begins with, so Barbara, tell me, how did it all begin? This has never exactly excited me, but I've always enjoyed reading those one-page affairs at the back of glossy magazines, which ask the same stereotypical questions to different people every week. Hugely diverse answers appear. So, I thought it would be fun to pose the same ten questions to some other notable women in the world of music and see what different answers they would give. This is what Answer Me 10 with Barbara Dixon is all about. I hope you enjoy the journey with me. Today's guest is British jazz singer Claire Teal. Brought up in Yorkshire, Claire developed a love for jazz standards and began to take music lessons from a young age. Her love of singing saw her pick up a recording contract with the Candid Jazz label with whom she released three solo albums. She gained the attention of Michael Parkinson who championed her work and she went on to sign the biggest ever recording contract by a British jazz artist when joining Sony Records in 2004. Since then, Claire has become a staple of the live concert circuit, performing with a trio, mini big band and renowned orchestras, including the Halley, released 15 critically acclaimed albums and been the recipient of many awards, including the prestigious BBC Jazz Awards. A consummate radio host, Claire presented her own big band show on Radio 2 for many years and recently started a new Sunday night show with Jazz FM. Question one, town or country? Um, Country, definitely. Uh, Although that said, I think the dream is living on the outskirts of a town. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> no, you're not allowed to do that, Claire. You've got to commit yourself here. Well, I, I grew up in the country, um, in, a, in a tiny village in Yorkshire. And um, I think that's where I feel calm when I can see green uh, and, you know, being able to kind of be uh, around nature. Um, I love birds. So as long as I can hear bird song, you know, I find it, it kind of really centering to sound a bit, you know, whatever. But living on the edge of a town means at least you can... You can nip in and have a coffee or, you know, a nice meal or whatever. Yeah, I couldn't live in a in a busy city. I, I love going, but I can't, you know, I think it's it's the pace of life. It's just too fast. <laughs> you know, Dr. Johnson said people who are tired of London are tired of life. But I just don't agree with that. At no, all. <laughs> no. I mean, I think that's it. Just being able to. And I think certainly during lockdown as well, I really appreciated being able to kind of, um, you know, potter about in the garden. Not that I do any gardening, but watch, you know, watch my other half pottering in the garden and just be able to just breathe in some nice fresh air and, you know, hang out. Hang out. It's, it's been a, a, a blessing. Have you actually made a choice to live in the country? So did you, like a lot of people, go and live in London? No, no, I, could, I, I couldn't I could do it. Um, the closest we came, we lived in Bath, uh, the city of Bath. For, oh, um, lovely. But that does that really count? I don't know, because it's so pretty. Well, Bath is so beautiful, <laughs> isn't it? It's, yeah. just, it's just so beautiful. Those lovely spa towns are kind of towns, but they're so genteel, aren't they? We lived there for about 15 years. And so we lived, we started off living right in the center of town. And then um, we moved up to, lucky enough to move up to one of the crescents at the top of town. So you had this amazing view. I mean, it's a really special place is Bath. Uh, but we kind of lived in flats there because we traveled so much. Yes. Um, and then, yes. <clears throat> you know, now now kind of having a house with a bit of a, a garden and stuff, um, we kind of moved further out. Question two, meat or veg? Meat. <laughs> Definitely. With veg, you know. (laughs) So you um, haven't embraced the new kind of eco living. I know. I really I want to. I I um I crave meat. Um 
Yeah, it's we don't funny. want any guilt on this program. No, We've not, have, you know. We have nothing to do with guilt. And I, I've had lots of people saying, I know I should give it up. But, you know, anyway. The, the thing that made me feel funny is when, um, when we got uh, our first dog. And then we've just got another dog. And that I do, that does make me feel a bit funny, you know, kind of eating meat when I've got these two amazing little dogs that you, you know, the guilt does kind of kick in. But I just. But you can't eat the dogs anyway. You wouldn't eat the dogs. And actually, dogs can't be vegetarians. That's like people who feed their cats on vegetables. Yeah. No, I mean, I like if Ottolenghi lived next door or somebody like that could make it a bit interesting. But I do, I do struggle, you know, with um, with kind of just vegetables as a meal. Um, but that might be my northern upbringing. I don't know. Well, I don't think it is in a way. I mean, I have to say, I have to show my hand here and say that um, I love vegetables. Nothing. I wouldn't if I was sitting down to an Ottolenghi sort of vegetarian palibongo or something. I would <laughs> actually. Uh, probably never noticed that there wasn't a lamb chop on the top of it yeah. at all because it's so beautiful. So like you, I love vegetables, but mm. I just don't want to eat that kind, funny kind of vegan food, which is so right on. It's grim. <laughs> <laughs> Anything with black pudding, that's fine. <laughs> oh, what's that one you have in Scotland? I really like. Is it white pudding and haggis? Oh, we have like white pudding too. and, and mm. the Irish. Uh, the Clonakilty white pudding is fantastic in mm. Ireland. But um, uh, haggis, of course, is the wonderful, wonderful, wonderful food. And somebody once said to me, oh, the vegetarian haggis is fantastic. Pointless. It isn't. <laughs> It's horrible. It's like alcohol-free beer. There's no point in it. I did all. have vegetarian black pudding and that was all right. But, oh, um, really? Well, mm. How did they make that then? Well, I think it was <laughs> because of the, you know, you've still got the pearl barley in there. So you had a yeah. bit of texture because black pudding is very smooth anyway. You see, I could work for the black pudding um, board of, you know, publicity or whatever, because I of think course. it's one of the superfoods. I absolutely love it. You know, I think it's so good for you. And you're and you're a northern lass, and you must yes. <laughs> stick up for yourself. Question three: TV, film, or books? I think it's probably got to be books, um, because I mean, until recently, we worked away, and we're constantly working, you know, all sorts of hours. So TV went out of the window. We never watched television, as in a kind of making sitting down to watch something. Um, and books are such a massive part of my work as well, because I, I do a radio show, which is all about kind of the history of the music that I love. And and so I do an awful lot of reading for that, but it's something I, I, I really enjoy. So I do a lot of research and I'm constantly buying books. You're buying reference books for what you've just described. I do a radio show about the big band and swing era. And so um, I buy biographies and kind of reference books and discographies and to find out about the recording sessions, you know, I'm interested in the microphones. I'm, I'm interested in what life was like for somebody like me back in, in the day when swing was pop music. I just found this wonderful biography. I've been waiting for two years to get hold of a copy and perhaps nobody else would be interested, but it was it was a biography of one of the big band singers, a woman called Helen Forrest, who was one of the best. Oh, and I've she, heard of Helen yeah. Forrest. Yeah. And she, she worked with um, Artie Shaw and Benny Goodman, yeah. Harry James. And it was her book was fascinating. She wrote it when she was 60. And it was just all about travel, you know, basically the, the lives that they led um, that, you know, kind of being on buses all the time, being tired all the time. It was very much like what we all go through when, when we're on tour so when you unwind and you 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 read for pleasure not for your work yeah. what would you read would so, you read what you've described or novels or something no i, I like or, novels i like kind of something that's a bit escapist um yeah so um really light easy reading um we just read uh i just read all the the um the sisters books the lucinda riley books there's just the the seventh one came out so i, I finished that one i'm um, reading miss benson's beetle at the moment and things like you know the sally red shoes um you know the pilgrimage of harold fry those kind of books where they're slightly quirky I um, don't know any of those books right. at all, Claire. You educate me. <laughs> well, so you know, what, what genre is that? I don't know. It's kind of 
I, it's sort of well they, they they they're always on kind of the the book list i don't know how you describe it really they're sort of i love books about people you know so if yes. they're quirky characters um that i can really get into not much has to happen um do you know what i mean but if i yes. if i'm kind of engaging with the character then uh, i love that kind of i love how people have the the ability to develop characters and keep your interest and stuff i always think there's an alchemy in writers i always so respect them because i it is something i mean i'm a songwriter but i can't i can't imagine writing a novel the the plots and the characters and the developments and the ideas involved i mean i know that i'm sure that a lot of people who write books say that about musicians how do you guys do that but but it is amazing isn't it and yeah. when you read a wonderfully written book some books are badly written and i i usually get bored with them if i'm i love novels as well but sometimes i can just give up say oh it's so badly written i can't, no. I can't do with it <laughs> yeah. really mm. enjoyed recently was grown ups by marion keys and and her twitter feeds are hilarious as well oh, i mean right. everything she utters is funny so follow her on on <laughs> social media if you can <laughs> question 4 night owl or early riser definitely night owl although again because of lockdown and um and dogs i found find that we you know getting up a lot earlier than we were because there's no excuse now we normally used to keep on kind of night time you know even because if we were doing two or three gigs a week and then going to london for the radio show it made sense to kind of stay you know in that kind of night time but then when lockdown first started we found that we were kind of you know watching telly for the first time and box sets and things and going yes. to bed at 4 o'clock in the morning <laughs> that's so interesting because we have you know it's such a huge variety of people that i've been speaking to and they've all had various reasons why they would get up early or get up late um, and i for always been instinctively an early riser even when i was young and i don't know why this is but wherever i've been whoever i've shared with i've always got up about 8 o'clock and got up even earlier obviously yeah. when my children yeah. were little i speak to other people who are instinctively night owls you yes. know they so would you say you're instinctively a night owl would yes. you like to stay up till 2 a.m. and get up at 10 easily if if i if i go to bed at midnight that's a, i'd say that was oh wow we're in bed by midnight you know early night so <laughs> yeah i am um, occasionally you know i i, I yeah occasionally occasionally it'll be 11 but no normally it's one or two you know and it just that's i don't know just feels that that's how my body clock works question 5 faith or fatalism interestingly i was raised catholic from um from you know being very tiny um but i i am not um a practicing catholic and the, the older i i get i i do believe in fate you know i um I absolutely do but I do believe that you know you you get out what you put in um so I'm all about kind of you know karma banks and karma points and just trying to do but I do you know I love horoscopes I love you know <laughs> I I love thinking I yeah I love that kind of you know we we follow one particular um astrologer and I love kind of think wow what's what's she saying about us today then do you believe that the the alignment of the planets then is important and and has an influence on our lives only when it's right <laughs> Oh that's selective astrology. <laughs> that's something totally different. You're not like Henry VIII who would go to war on the right day. No, but you know there's there's that thing called have you ever heard of Mercury in retrograde or or Mercury being in retrograde? Yes, yes I have. Mercury is something to do with communication, isn't it? And when Mercury is in retrograde, everything goes wrong and communication breaks down and <laughs> you know trains are missed and appointments are missed and arguments happen. And if ever I've had like the worst week I can guarantee that I'll look and see when you know Mercury is in retrograde. It's like, oh, hello, yes, there we go. <laughs> so yeah, I think it's. I, I think you know we've we're we're a little mere specks, aren't we? we? You know, we've been here for two seconds in this massive world, and and there's a lot of things that we don't understand. I also um, think that what you're talking about is kind of trying to make sense of the chaos yeah. of life. You know, I think you know there are a few 
extremely brainy academic people out there who kind of think they know it all and I always hate them you know what I mean <laughs> I think that's what are you talking about what do you know about anything you're a speck yeah. like the rest of us yeah but actually there there is there is a great comfort I mean I am a, a practicing Catholic mm -hmm. and there is a great comfort in it I never proselytize at all i mean i'm not interested in arguing about faith no. with anybody no but but it's such a personal thing and 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 i'm interested in where people find comfort and sense uh, in nonsense you know so so that's that's brilliant i, I think so. growing up in 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 the catholic faith uh, it did it certainly made me feel safe and i loved um I love the whole, I love going to church. I love the whole, um, I love the mass. I love the bells and the smells. I loved, um, I loved the joining in bits. I love the kind of community aspect of it. But my dad was an atheist and yet he, you know, he had exactly the same principles. And so I learned kind of, you know, my mom would kind of go to, to church many times a week, but my dad was, he was a really good guy, you know, and I think you can, that's what I say, you can kind of follow your own path. And actually, whatever faith you, you follow, I mean, what, you know, in, in all the world faiths, there are great people. And it's actually not the doctrine in many cases that's wrong. It's the way people interpret it. Fundamentalism yeah. is a really bad idea, regardless mm. of which faith you're in. And uh, you follow an astrology of it saying, what do you want it to say? I like that. Oh, yeah. Yeah. It's like <laughs> if we're having a good day or a bad day. You see, my other half's Taurus as well. So, and, you know, we, we, we're both very Taurus. So there's, a, yeah, this lady called Jessica Adams and she's, um, she, yeah, I just think, but I think she, yeah, she, I often kind of, she writes, yeah, stuff that we kind of like, oh yeah, that did happen. Or, or if, you know, look forward to that happening then. And if it doesn't, it's like, oh, well, she's having an off day. It's, it's interesting, <laughs> isn't it? Trying to make sense of the universe, which is yeah. what you're doing in your tiny little way there. That's mm. great. Question six, Facebook or the phone? Do you know, I have to be really honest, neither. <laughs> I, so you don't like either? No, no. I, I think before before I um, was able to sing professionally, I used to work in a call center. I used to sell advertising on the phone and I, I can't I can't stand the phone. You know, I find, well, it's not like I can't stand the phone. I love talking to people, but I, f I find the, the actual medium of the phone quite difficult and um and facebook i'm not a natural i think i'm a bit of a um introvert you know in that um i'm kind of quite happy in my own space and, and being on my own and sometimes i really need that um but luckily my other half is completely different and she loves being on the phone and she is you know does facebook and everything so i managed to keep in touch with people through her but if it wasn't for her i don't honestly know what i do i could probably live in a cave I mean, I use uh, Facebook for my work, but I yeah. actually don't don't involve myself in that. Me too. I do involve myself in in Twitter, but I don't follow it really regularly. I just, and I don't actually use the phone either, but I do use it because I need to use it. But I yes. don't. I never think. Oh, I know I'm going to have a lovely chat with somebody. I'm not like that. I do it out of duty, basically. Yeah. Yes. I contact people out of duty. And my cut, my my brother, my only brother lives in Canada, and I love him to bits. And I do get a lot of pleasure talking to him and one or two of my very, very closest people, but I would never keep in touch by, well, I do keep in touch by phone, but I wouldn't I treat this situation with great joy and rapture. Yeah, yeah, I never look forward to making a phone call, but I'm always really pleasantly surprised, you know, and I, and I, I, I think lockdown, I think things like FaceTime and Zoom have, have, have helped actually, because my mum lives up in Yorkshire and she's 250 miles away. And during lockdown, it was ever so hard to know that she was on her own. But her, you know, she got a new iPad and we got it set up. And, oh, and fantastic. So being able to talk to her and see her and make sure that she was all right. Uh, and she she goes to mass every day on her iPad. So it's it's kind of, you know, communication is, is so important. But yeah. yeah, well, it's it was it was a lifeline, mm. and I have been in. Uh, I've just been visiting relatives uh, in the, the south southwest, and mm -hmm. I haven't seen them for ages. But as I was traveling down, I realized I had 
seen quite a lot of them, but it was through Zoom. But I hadn't touched them. Yeah. So that was the difference, and it yeah. was so wonderful to touch oh, them. No. You don't go into Facebook to see what all the people you know no, are I doing. Use That's it. not I, part of your your no, world. I use it for work. I use it to get the information out that you know if people want to come to concerts or whatever or listen to the radio show. And like yourself, I I do Twitter because um, I can I can I can get my head around that. But um, yeah, that that's the the limit of it. Yeah, I mean, I love technology. I love the fact that your phone can do all these things. But um, yeah, I just uh, I appreciate it from a distance. <laughs> Question seven: Shower or bath? If well, if I had the time, I'd I'd have a bath every day because um, it's that you know it's such a luxury. Um, you know, you see, I actually have a fear of water, so I don't like I don't like the sea. I don't like swimming, um, and I get quite claustrophobic. But I love having a bath. It's some, it's a controllable thing, isn't it? But being able to kind of you know make the water smell nice, put some nice oils in, and da da da, it can make you. I can just I don't know. I suffer with back pain as well, and I think it's just a taking some time out to relax, read your book, um, you know, have a. Have a, a glass of whatever uh, on on the side. Ah, <laughs> so you would take a book in the bath and a glass of wine, and you'd light a candle and you'd have some oil in there. Yeah, yeah. <gasps> if I had the time, in reality, you're dashing in the shower, aren't you? Because you've got to get off and do something. But in my in my dream world, I would have um, I'd have a bath every day. It's interesting, actually, because I, if I have a bath, and I, I can have a bath as well, say at the weekend where I wouldn't have to hit the ground running, I'd have a bath in the morning. I think if I had to get out of bed, put my clothes on and go off, I'd feel a bit sort of funny and manky. Yeah, I think the decadence, though, the, the most decadent thing <gasps> is that afternoon, a bath in the afternoon <laughs> when, when the sun's shining. And you kind of, you know, that's the time you should not be having a bath. There's things to do. There's kids to watch. <laughs> <laughs> Somebody said to me that in the uh, in the winter, it's nice to come in from a long, cold walk and have a bath. Yeah. Question eight. Spring or autumn? Autumn. Right. Why? Good things happen in autumn. Um, I don't know why. <clears throat> Just always have. Um, I love... Like from a sensory point of view, I, I I just I don't know. My senses seem to come alive. There's there's um I love the smell of autumn. I love the the fact that Christmas is around the corner. I love I I don't do well in heat. I'm not you know I'm summer is a pain. Uh, you know I'd, I'd really you know I don't like it. I I I need to be slightly cold. You know you sound um, like a Viking. There's a lot of Vikings in Yorkshire. <laughs> I just did one of those Ancestry.com things and I was thinking there'll be something, there'll be something interesting. And it just said, no, you're from Yorkshire. I was like, oh, okay. <laughs> well, that's a good enough thing. There are people who call it God's own country, you know. Yeah, so no, I like, I love autumn, so it's not too cold, but all the leaves are turning, you know, and I love all those colours. It doesn't make you sad that they're no. dying and dying back, no? No, I don't think of it like that. I just think it's like a, a blaze of glory almost it's like these fantastic colors and yeah i mean obviously spring is wonderful because it's all you know all the things are kind of growing again but no i love autumn because you said that you were born in may i presume it's may that you were born or yes. end of april um i just thought to myself oh yeah she's going to be a spring she's mm -hmm. going to be a spring girl because of her birthday but that's so interesting that you've chosen the other end of the year and it doesn't make you sad and you and you mentioned christmas because i i think that the don't we ever need a midwinter festival it's oh, terribly yeah. important what a isn't great it? idea to have to have our our Christmas celebration. I'm not a New Year girl myself. I've never really joined in with the pagan festivals very mm -hmm. much, but I do. But I love Christmas because of all sorts of things. But goodness, we need it by then. We just need something. That's, oh, what we need know, is another festival. In there the you go. Of do you know, we lived February. in Glastonbury for about <laughs> five years, and yeah. um, that my goodness, if you want, you know. There's always something being celebrated <clears throat> and in a way that you couldn't ever believe. Um, and it was it was a it's a it is a really magical, mystical place. And I will never, ever, you know, 
poo poo anybody's thoughts on anything ever again. It's like, if you want to, you know, if you believe in crystal therapy, I, it's fine. Do your thing, whatever, you know, whatever works for you. And it, it was a real eye opener living there, you know, and you'd kind of, we'd look out the window sometime and there'd be a druid march, you know, <laughs> a druid walk by or the yes, goddesses would yeah. be celebrating their stuff or, yeah. do you know what I mean? It was, uh, it, yeah, it was a pretty wonderful place. It is what we were saying earlier about about faith and fatalism. You know, it's what, what if you adhere to some gentle means of making sense of the world, then in do doing no harm to anybody, then yeah. I see no reason why that should be stamped on by anyone. No, you know, each, you know what? In one of the most incredible things we ever saw, there's a, a festival of Beltane, which is the first of May, and so yeah. going up to the Glastonbury Tor, <clears throat> which we lived very close to, so you you walk up to the tours before sunrise yeah and there we were met we'd never it was just when we'd moved there and uh there you know you're supposed to say happy beltane to everybody and at the bottom there was the the kind of chief druid or druidess or or whatever and uh you know so happy beltane and she went happy beltane as if it was and really meant it and i was like oh that's nice and we <laughs> we walked up to the top of the tour and at the top there were um, loads and loads of druids. There were the goddesses who are this, it's a kind of a religion in its own right. There were loads of Morris dancers. There were green men. So there were about 200 people of every persuasion you could imagine and waiting for this, for the sun to, to rise. And as it comes up, the sun shoots through the, the middle of the tour. And it was like, Wow. And so the, the <laughs> Morris dancers were all singing Jerusalem and they're all dancing around and, and the goddesses were kind of making this funny kind of, you know, noise. And, and all the druids are standing with their arms up facing the sun. And you were like, wow, this all means something to everybody here, but in a completely different way. And they're having a good time, and that's the main there thing. And the, it's keeping them occupied, keeping people occupied as well. And it's you know <laughs> whatever floats your boat, so okay, <laughs> as long as you're doing no harm, which that's they're it. not. Question nine: Dine out or take out? Well, now here's the thing: uh, I love food, I love cooking, uh, and I love eating out, um, and I love takeaways. So I'd, I don't know, all of them really. Um, I love you know I love cooking at home. And as long as people are involved and you're sharing food together, uh, you know, we, we often have a lot of friends over and everybody cooks together and we kind of make a, you know, a big feast that everyone can enjoy. Would um, you dress up to go out? Well, yes. If I, if I if I had, I love going out. You know, I, I'm one of those people though. I will always look at the menu before I get there and I always know what I'm going to have before I arrive. <laughs> Oh my goodness, that is interesting. I don't think I've ever done that. Oh yeah, no, I am. Um, you know, because I'm interested, and it's like, oh, and I, you know, I want to read, and if, especially if it's a restaurant where people have had certain things, I'll kind of, I want to know what everybody right. thinks is the, you know, the standard. So what? Dish. How do you feel about the? Um, I mean, this is just me sort of going on again, mm. but about um, I, I'm getting really upset with takeout containers we rarely uh, take take away i mean yeah. i i live in the middle of edinburgh but i yeah. never really go out uh, yeah. socially here but uh takeaways it's the containers it's yeah. these containers these plastic things they drive me mad that's no. what stops me doing it yeah no we don't we don't have often have takeaways uh, but my other, my partner mud is um she's allergic to a lot of um food so that kind of we don't we don't do that so <laughs> well that yeah that is good and actually my son has started a a pop-up restaurant in bristol oh, wow. and um he's got um uh, he, he he's got these wonderful when i say the wonderful they are really nice looking sort of um uh, cardboard containers mm. for the food so mm. people there's no plates people because it's a pop-up yeah people are taking things away and these lovely cardboard containers which are completely recyclable and they 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 they're quite substantial do you know what i mean yeah. you yeah. wouldn't think oh that's going to leak through the, the the paper of the cardboard not at all yeah and i just thought well that's for me i would almost would like to buy something like that apart from the fact i bought loads of it because it was my son of course yeah. <laughs> but, <laughs> but actually if it hadn't been my son i would have thought i'm going to buy one of them to help that person yeah because it was such a lovely concept you yes. know because i can't stand these 
these terrible it's the polystyrene plastic stuff, things with it. it. Yeah. yeah, and the lids. Question 10. High heels or trainers? Definitely trainers for um a, a personal choice. Um high heels for work, although I did actually do my first gig uh a couple of days ago. Um and <laughs> I couldn't face putting the heels on. I was like, oh, do you know? So I, th- I got these kind of platform trainers and I thought it's an outdoor gig. I'll, I'll wear those because they'll be comfortable. And so I wore them and they rubbed me raw. So, <laughs> Oh, <laughs> wow. And they were supposed to be comfortable. <laughs> so there Isn't you go. Isn't that learn. interesting? But, mm. you know, there, there is, I'm just thinking that there's, there's legions of women out there, performers, who are not going to want to get back into their high no. heels again because no. we haven't been in high heels for you know I haven't I, I I wear I've got a pair of ankle boots that I wore to to go to supper with someone around the corner from us mm. and I did honestly look like Dick Emery walking along the road <laughs> They were about an inch and a half, little stack heel, and it was like they were stilettos, you know. I felt like Katie Price going out for the evening, you know, it was ridiculous. I've worn them. I've had to wear them, you know, for work. I've never, I've never enjoyed wearing them. And I always feel that I walk, I can't walk properly in them. You know, it's it's like the Ministry of of Silly Walks. And (laughs) I was working with this guy in Belgium um, called Helmut Lotti, and he was doing this television special for a German TV channel. And so I, I kind of went over and I, I'd, I'd sung a song on his um, on his swing album. And so um, all I had to do was, you know, join in this one song. And I, I we got there, and there's a massive great staircase as part of the set. And I'm like, no, 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 no. And I just recently broke my arm because I'm really clumsy. And um, I was like, no, I can't. Um, I'm not going down those stairs. No, oh, no. no. <laughs> and they were like, no, you, you must. It's part of the, you know, the routine. I was like, yep. I didn't know anything about routine. Anyway, of course, I do end up on these um, on these steps. And so helmet, you know, but I'm walking like I've got calipers on. There was no safety rails or anything at the back. It was actually oh. terrifying. <laughs> Good and there were these girl. dancers kind of throwing themselves down the stairs. Oh, and like, my God. And so I'm halfway me. down and Helmut comes up to me. He said, Miss Teal, is there something wrong with your eyes? <laughs> said, no. it, yeah. So I had to have a lesson in walking down. You have to walk down sideways. Who knew? Yeah. And, and, and also you can't look, if you're on television, you can't look at your feet, which is what you would do on a oh. staircase in real life. Do you know, it's I, nuts and 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 yeah. so dangerous. Really it's very dangerous. dangerous, and you know, I think that's why I love yeah. radio so much. I love that you know, quite I, I think, right. Could it, you sit? Yeah, you're sitting that you can sit there with your pajamas and your trainers <laughs> on. Well, but but I I'm looking forward to getting back into my sort of stacked heeled boots. I like sort of funky boots because yeah. I want to be a funky old lady, <laughs> and that's what I'm going to be doing next year, God willing, when I uh, when I strut my stuff seriously. Oh, but it has been such a pleasure to talk to you. I you mean, too. you have been a communicative, lovely woman. <laughs> and and I really, really enjoy the, the series anyway. But I've loved what you've said because you've said many, many original things, which, of course, <laughs> is what happens. So, Claire, thank you so much. It's been you, such a pleasure. You too, Barbara. It's a real, real pleasure to do this. Thank you. Take care. You too, love. Bye. Thanks for listening to Answer Me 10 with me, Barbara Dixon. This podcast was recorded in Edinburgh in 2021 and produced and edited by Lee Noble and John Eden.